afternoon and welcome everyone to the Chicago Debates Criminal Justice Lecture Series. I am Dr. Toynette Gunn and I am the Executive Director for Chicago Debates and I am delighted to be here this afternoon with you um, on the topic today of police accountability. We are so honored and thrilled to have as our special guest, um, Chief Sidney Roberts, Chief Administrator for the Chicago Civilian Office of Police Accountability, better known as COPA. In this capacity, Chief Roberts leads the city's civilian police oversight body with full administrative investigative authority of all officer involved shootings, deaths in custody or result of police action, as well as all complaints of excessive force, illegal search and seizure, domestic violence, denial of counsel, coercion, and sex and race-based verbal abuse. Chief Roberts has over 30 years of experience in community advocacy, law enforcement, and public integrity. Leadership positions have included First Deputy Inspector General for the Illinois Office of Executive Inspector General, and Inspector General for the Illinois Department of Human Services. Please join me in welcoming Chief Sidney Roberts. Thank you, Dr. Gunn. It's just wonderful to be here. We are delighted to have you. And audience, we have a special guest. Joining um, Chief Roberts, we have Ephraim Edie. And Ephraim, I'm gonna allow you to just introduce yourself. We're delighted that you were able to jump on with us. We didn't plan that. And so thank you for being prepared to just jump in when we asked you to. Well, great, it's exciting to be here. Actually, I am born and raised city of Chicago. Uh, Southside is uh, what I would claim today. Uh, so hopefully that doesn't turn anyone off to anything that I may say. Uh, but uh, I actually uh, graduated from Northern Illinois University and immediately came to Chicago on the west side of Chicago and really helped uh, build uh, uh, grassroots organizations that help um, uh, people with low to no marketable skills uh, for the People's Community Development Association of Chicago. And then did seven years of prison reform work going in and out of prisons and developing programs and helping uh, push some uh, state uh, policies and laws that could really help with people once they were uh, coming home from prison. And then did six years with uh, Chicago Public Schools uh, really uh, um, pushing efforts for kids to have suitable after school programming, especially if they didn't have um, certain kinds of programs that other schools had during school hours. So did that for six years. And then now three years of uh, police reform with COPA. I serve currently as the chief spokesman and public information officer. So I'm dealing a lot with media, uh, the community, Chicago Police Department, elected officials, just really that external messaging on behalf of the agency, um, just carrying that message of COPA uh, to the broader Chicago community and obviously representing Chief Roberts uh, when needed. So glad to be here today. Awesome, thank you for being here. Now, before we jump in with the questions, um, this is such a relevant area for us. And again, delighted to have you both joining us. As we think about the year, our students are debating on the topic of criminal justice reform. and. Under that topic, there are lots of different things that they are able to um, uh, look at, and policing is one of them. And we want to talk to you about um, your role, uh, Chief Roberts, at COPA. And just, I shared very high level um, in your intro of what you do, kind of what your background is, but break it down in layman terms for us, uh, for our students to help them best understand like the work that COPA is doing um, and, and how relevant this is to the topic of criminal justice reform. Absolutely. And again, I'm just really, really excited to, to be here. Um, I've been following Chicago debates for a little while. Um, I met Dr. Gunn, uh, as you know, maybe about a year ago, um, and I've just been really excited about what you guys do. So yes, um, police accountability um, is a part of police reform, which is a part of criminal justice reform. And so for, for COPA, um, we are a part of the Chicago Police Accountability System. In the city of Chicago, it is a layered system. So the first piece of police reform is the actual police department and making sure that the officers are doing, you know, what they're supposed to do and um, providing appropriate mentorship and appropriate supervision. 
The second layer of police reform is, is COPA and Chicago's Bureau of Internal Affairs. The third level of police reform is uh, police accountability in the city of Chicago is the police board who is responsible for carrying out uh, discipline of an officer. So for, for COPA, uh, we are responsible for doing police mis administrative police misconduct investigations of certain uses of force. So that's all officer involved shootings, all taser discharges that result in death or serious bodily injury, and all deaths as a result of, of uh, police, uh, police use of force that are in custody. Those we investigate no matter what, they, the incident just has to occur. The other class of um, violations that COPA investigates has to be precipitated by an actual complaint from an individual or from an observation by the police department themselves. So that would be excessive force, domestic violence, improper search and seizure, denial of counsel, coercion, and verbal abuse that is bias or sex-based in nature. All other complaints would be handled by the Department of Police Bureau of Internal Affairs. That is, if an officer didn't do a thorough investigation, if an officer didn't uh, display his badge or display her um, ID card, if an officer stopped someone and didn't give them the required uh, stop card, that would be handled by the actual police department. So when COPA gets an investigation, if it's an officer involved shooting, we respond in real time to the location of that shooting. So that could be at two o'clock in the morning, we will show up, we show up with our major case investigators. These are officers that are proficient in conducting police shooting investigations. Our evidence specialists will, will uh, respond. We'll have a supervisor, a deputy chief. We'll begin to canvas for witnesses. We will review body worn camera. We will get a walkthrough through the crime scene. We'll go to the autopsy, we'll go to the hospital. We start our investigation in actual real, real time. Now I mentioned officers and I should qualify. We are not officers. We are civilians. We are members of the Chicago community in all neighborhoods from the North to the South, Inglewood, Austin, all the way up to where Ephraim is up in uh, Rogers Park. Um, our backgrounds are, we could be former law enforcement. We're attorneys, we're prosecutors, defense attorneys, um, uh, civilian, um, uh, investigators, I mean, you know, we represent the full gamut of, of, of backgrounds, but we're also people that have been impacted by police misconduct. And so we truly represent the community when we're carrying out these investigations. Now, if it's, a, if it's a, um, an excessive force, we, and we received a complaint, we will do the same thing. We interview all the witnesses, we review all body worn camera, um, we review all medical records, all police reports, and then at the conclusion of our investigation, we will write a narrative report that will identify whether or not the officer's actions were consistent with policy or outside of policy. And I say that because COPA, we do administrative investigations. Criminal investigations are either handled by the Department of Police or we will work with the Cook County State's Attorney's Office, but our jurisdiction, because we are civilians and we're not law enforcement, is the administrative investigations. And when we're done, we post our reports onto our website and so that everybody has the opportunity to see um, how we reached our conclusions. I think I kind of covered a, a, an overview of what we do. That is extremely thorough. I really appreciate that. And one of the things that um, jumps out for me is um, very much like Ephraim has you know, claimed the South Side. I'm a South Sider born and raised. And um, of course, we're familiar with police um, misconduct and, and, and police shootings and things of that nature. And I think immediately when you think about a police shooting, you know that you know, that's, you know, the most egregious and if there's a, you know, fatality involved. And so, you know, that there's an investigation and things that will happen with that. But some of these other things that you mentioned, like a police just not, you know, showing up and not showing their badge or a police, you know, um, just handling something inappropriately speaking, in, you know, inappropriately to um, someone on the street. 
where, and, and maybe this is more of a question for Ephraim, but how do residents come to know, like, this is where you're supposed to go and do that, right? So as I think about it again, as a, a resident, you know, um, of the city growing up in the city, I don't live in the city anymore, but I don't necessarily remember um, like, oh, hey, you're going to need to go to COPA if there was something inappropriate done when you're engaging with the police officer. How do people come to know like this is where they should be going and just to know of you in general outside of these police shootings? Well, uh, I appreciate the question. Um, actually, I think it's really on. Uh, and I think uh, Chief Roberts really mentioned it. Um, really having a passion for this work personally. And I think being from Chicago or knowing Chicago neighborhoods, having a sense of Chicago, you, 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 you start to learn how Chicago works, right? So one of the strategies that we've used is a term that uh, Chief Roberts use, uses often, that's meaning the people where they are. So for us, it's really about getting out in the neighborhoods and how our approach really started was going to those neighborhoods, those wards, those zip codes, those police districts, where we saw the highest level of police interactions and the highest level of complaints. And so through that, we started going to churches and ward meetings and uh, block club meetings, community group meetings and really getting the word out. Right. So that's like that's one way of starting that and not just doing that through kind of emails. But Chicago is a grassroots type of of city and it's a city of neighborhoods that what works in one neighborhood doesn't necessarily work in another. But that was our initial approach. And then it was to find those groups that were really um, uh, made policing and police accountability a part of their cause and really connecting with them. So that's working with community activists and, mm -hmm. and meeting with them and community stakeholders who are often championing the community's causes and things of that nature, uh, uh, whether it's to elected officials or groups like us and really finding a way to do that. But then also doing the simple things. One of the things that we did, we put the COPA icon on every um, computer in Chicago public school, I mean, Chicago, Chicago public libraries, doing something that simple so that it's on their homepage. Maybe they get curious and want to know who we are. And so that's another way to find us. But then on top of that, we start holding informational sessions in every library, in every police district. And then we stretch that to the schools and we really start going to the schools and doing mock investigations, not just so that people will know who we are, but so that they can see how a COPA investigation occurs. We've been able to do this with thousands of young people over the past three years. And we've done kind of creative things like that with boots on the ground mm -hmm. instead of just a digital campaign, but put in a face and a level of interaction and, 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 and a kind of a personal touch so that people can not only kind of know who we are as an agency, but know who we are as people that, as Chief Roberts said, we are civilians. We have some of the same concerns or similar experiences, but yet professional, professional enough to do an investigation. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. And uh, the collaboration with the community organizations, um, certainly I would think, you know, just kind of, um, you know, um, expands your your reach um, to communities and neighborhoods. Um, so thank you for that. Um, when we think about police reform um, or criminal justice reform, I should say, what are, as our students are looking at researching and arguing why this is necessary and why the government needs to do more. Um, Chief Roberts, what are some of the current police reform efforts that are at play uh, right now? So, you know, I, I want to go back a little bit to, to the first question that you, you asked of Ephraim, and that is, you know, how do we inform the community about what COPA does and how COPA does it. Because when we think about police reform and what it is, I think we have to start with the first question of why do we need police reform? And we need police reform because the community, the people that are being policed need to trust that police officers are doing the job that they're supposed to do. We need to have, they, the, we need to view law enforcement as a legitimate body in order to even allow ourselves to be policed. Um, and so the work that, that 
that we do in terms of educating the community not only builds trust and confidence in the accountability system, but we also take the opportunity to educate the community on how the police do their, their job. And so when we're thinking about police reform, it is more than just the accountability system. Okay. You know, police reform is a multi-layered, comprehensive set of measures that are aimed at one, making sure that the police department is recruiting and hiring people that are suited to do the job. Policing is not a job for everyone. And so um, part of the police reform measures are making sure that we're hiring and recruiting people that are emotionally and mentally capable to do the job, making sure that we're hiring and recruiting um, people from diverse backgrounds, diverse experiences. But, uh, but police reform is also about making sure that the police department provides the requisite training to do the job. Now we know, and um, as a former law enforcement officer, I can tell you my experience when I went to the police academy. Admittedly, it was a long time ago, but not a whole lot has, has changed until just recently. And I will say the majority of the time was spent teaching me how to arrest someone and how to use my firearm. I came out very proficient in those two skill sets. Most officers will go their entire career without ever firing their weapon. Many will go without ever drawing their weapon, but every single day they're asked to solve someone's problem. And it might not be a criminal problem. It is simply solving a landlord tenant dispute. The gentleman upstairs from me is spent, is, 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 is making too much noise and they call the police. And I'm not saying that that is the proper police call, but that is the call that people make. And so making sure that we're, we're training officers to, to um, engage with people who are having a mental crisis, to how to communicate with people who have developmental disabilities, to have more tools and to use more tools in their toolbox other than their firearm. One of the best de-escalation techniques is time. That gentleman does not have to be arrested right now at this moment. If he is upset, allow him to calm himself down. If he's not causing a problem, allow him to, to calm himself down. And so when we talk about police reform, it's also about training. And I mentioned this earlier, but once we hire an officer, we have to make sure that they remain emotionally and mentally fit to continue to do the job. Law enforcement officers see people doing their worst, at their worst, experiencing their worst. That takes an emotional and mental toll on anyone. And right now, our system of policing doesn't really have a, um, a defined manner to make sure that officers are mentally and psychologically fit, to make sure that they're given the time to process some of the things that that they have that they have seen. Um, and so police reform, it's it's it is very, very uh, comprehensive. It's a lot. Um, the city of Chicago is really, really working very hard to address all of the training, the hiring, um, the accountability system is a big piece of it. But one of the things that I think has hurt policing for so long is that the response to bad policing was just accountability. When something would go wrong, the communities, I want them fired, I want them fired, I want them fired. And guess what? Sometimes the guy got fired, sometimes the individual didn't get fired. But what they didn't do was to modify their training. They didn't modify the policies. And so for years, we didn't fix the system. We focused our efforts on the individual, but now not only is Chicago, but policing nationally, they are focused on preventing, not just responding, but preventing. Um, and that I think in my 30 some odd years working in policing is the difference that is happening today. Today, we are truly looking to reform the entire 
not only criminal justice, obviously criminal justice system, but the entire policing system from beginning to end so that we can bring about a more constitutional and procedurally just policing system. I, I apologize for going too long, but it's police reform. It's just, it's, it's a loaded question. Yeah, absolutely. No, I appreciate the, the depth of that and for taking us a step back to say, well, let's start here. Um, and I'm listening to you and writing some notes just so that I can make sure that I keep my train of thought as well. This is all such um, good information. And I heard you speaking about um, the systemic pieces that are necessary um, in this reform work, as well as the individual pieces, um, speaking to the individual officer. And as you started off in the beginning of this interview, speaking about um, how you do at COPA address officer behavior or misconduct, mm -hmm. that is on the individual side. And we can see very easily what in what you described, how you all are working to hold officers themselves accountable. But tell us a little bit more about what COPA is doing on the systemic side. So when you speak about the necessary for them to um, necessary um, hiring needs, the training that's necessary, the um, focus on mental health and emotional health and, and, and well-being of the officer, um, how are you all then working in concert with um, the the police to change those systems in addition to the work that you're doing? with the individual officers. Yeah, Dr. Gunn, thank you. And, and, and your question is extremely timely. Um, one of the things that uh, through our ordinance, we have the authority to, um, to make policy recommendations to the department. And um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but COPA actually just celebrated its third anniversary. And uh, the first two years of our existence was really focused on uh, getting a handle on our caseload, perfecting our investigative process, and building those relationships with the community, building that trust um, also with, with, with law enforcement. And most recently this year, we have been focusing our efforts on identifying patterns and trends that we can bring forward to the department so that they can start addressing some of the procedural and training issues. Um, as a matter of fact, we just launched what we are calling uh, PRAD, the COPA Policy Research and Analysis Division. And so some of the things that we were doing, and actually I'll, I'll just highlight something most recently, uh, we are all very familiar with the protests that happened not too long ago. Um, and there were, there were key themes that that we saw there. Not only were officers uh, either not equipped or activating their body worn camera, but we also saw that officers were um, not wearing their their badges and not wearing their IDs. Um, we also, but we also discovered that officers were asked uh, and being required to redeploy with only six hours of sleep. Hmm after working a 12 hour shift and then having a, 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 a six hours of sleep before they're being asked to, to, to come back. We also saw that the department's records on where officers were located um, was deficient, which is not only a safety issue for the department, but from an accountability standpoint, um, when we couldn't identify an officer, they were not able to tell us who was at that particular corner. One of the other things that we have seen um, and, and have brought to the attention of, of, of the police department are those instances in um, improper search and seizure. Um, as many of you know, and you've seen, or potentially you're aware, where officers have executed search warrants on the wrong house, or officers um, have exceeded the limits of the search warrant. And so one of the things that we were doing when we were doing our investigations, we were highlighting that, hey, these officers were unfamiliar with the laws that govern search and seizure. And we were recommending that they engage in more training, that they provide more uh, scenario-based training. And just recently, 
they sent us the training materials and said, COPA, can you look at this to make sure that we are addressing the concerns that you have seen, the infractions that you have seen? And so not only are we telling them about patterns and trends that we believe will um, lead to or perpetuate misconduct, they've taken our feedback and have said, yes, we're not going to just train that particular officer. We're going to train and retrain our entire department. And now we want your input to make sure that it addresses those concerns that you have seen through the course of your investigation. And so um, that's something that's very new um, for, for, for COPA. Um, and that relationship that we're having with the department is building trust between us and the department because, I mean, we investigate their officers. And so there can be that, that tension. Um, but we're, we're developing a trust of respect um, to where we can actually continue to work for the betterment of the department, which ultimately benefits the city itself. So that sounds fantastic in that you are able to make some recommendations to the department, um, helping to um, you know, revise training materials to better familiarize the officers with laws and different things of that nature. Um, what's the timeline that we're looking at when we say like, this is something that needs to happen, right? And we're making this recommendation. Does the recommendation come with the timeline? Do you just leave it up to the police department to say how long it's gonna take for them to implement and execute on this? What happens from the moment someone says, hey, we're making this recommendation to implementation? So there are some um, statutory requirements that have to come. Once COPA makes a recommendation, the department has 60 days to respond to us to say whether or not they're going to follow that recommendation. Um, but once they say that they're going to follow the recommendation, there is no time frame in which for them to respond. But one of the things that uh, we are... Um, one of the things that Pratt will do will be responsible for following up with the department to, to, to assess the extent of their compliance. So this time next year, I might have a better idea uh, about whether or not uh, the department moves forward with the recommendations that they say they're going to do. We will be sitting in on the Fourth Amendment training, so we will be able to assess and actually view that training. Um, but as to some of the other uh, policy recommendations, we will our procedural recommendations, we'll have to wait and see and give them the opportunity to to do it. So you mentioned Pratt again, and I wrote that down, but I didn't capture the acronym what it what it stands for. Can you tell us that again so that we can put that in our chat here for um, for future reference? Absolutely. It's the Policy Research Analysis Division. They're the agency that, or they're the unit within COPA that will be making um, policy, procedural, and training recommendations. So some of the recommendations um, that we have made has been has centered around um, drug testing and alcohol testing, an officer following a shooting. Uh, we've issued advisories about the manner in which the department was engaging with members of the transgender community. Uh, we will be releasing a um, uh, body-worn camera policy recommendation. Uh, we will also be releasing a recommendation regarding um, uh, retaining the evidentiary records when officers engage in the execution of a search warrant. So I think Ephraim um, is going to put something in there that will bring you to our website. And when you are on our website, if you go to our um, publications, that's where you'll see some of this information. Okay, thank you. Um, so this next question is really probably a combination of um, some of your work and some of Ephraim's work in terms of, you mentioned the body cam and some uh, reform that's coming around that and different uh, policy and procedural recommendations. Um, transparency, right, has been a really big issue with the community and police and really 
um, crying out and demanding that there is some transparency. And I can see that body cam is one way of doing that. Um, but you're hearing these cries over and over from the community that um, just as we ju you just described the process of making some recommendations for some change, but really, how do we know, right? What, what, what happens from this point to that point? So it's not all about, you know, um, when they're out on the streets policing that we're able to see what officers are doing, but there are other things happening behind the scenes. How do we, um, how do you keep things transparent? What are other ways to, to make what's happening around reform transparent and the accountability piece more transparent for the community? Yeah, so I think, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of, as I mentioned, police reform, you know, when we're talking about transparency, I think we have to start, or I have to start with the why. Why do we want transparency? And it goes back to that same thing. It goes back to the legitimacy of the police department to infringe on my rights. I mean, if we, if we, you know, take it all the way back, the reason why, um, or rather not the reason why, but our constitution, our state laws and our federal laws allow law enforcement officers to deprive us of our liberty rights to move about the city freely. It allows law enforcement to take our life and we need transparency in the manner in which police officers are carrying out those functions so that we will allow that department or allow the institution to deprive us of those rights. And so one of the things that we think about when we're thinking about transparency is we have to be transparent about what police can do, which means we as citizens, have to educate ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, if the police can can make a traffic stop, if they can stop us from driving, we need to know under what circumstances they can stop us. So that when they do stop us, and if we say, why did you stop me? And the, the, the officer says, because the tinting on your windows are too dark, we should already know that. You know, and so there has to be some transparency in the laws that govern our behavior. But there also has to be transparency in the actions that the officer took. The officer needs to tell an individual what they're doing and why they are doing it. And if there are questions about whether or not the officer has that authority, the officer can say, listen, this is what I'm doing, but if you have an issue or have questions about why I've taken this, here is a card. You can call COPA or you can call my sergeant or you can call my department. And so transparency in what police do and why they do it. But the second piece of that transparency is I want to see what they're doing when they're doing it. And that's that body worn camera. That's what body worn camera can do. Um, but the officers have to have it and they have to activate it, which at times is, is a challenge. I mean, we have seen um, far too many instances where an officer has not activated their body worn camera. But from an investigative standpoint, I can tell you that body worn camera exonerates an officer of misconduct complaints more when they have their body worn camera on when they don't, because we have objective and independent evidence to provide context to what happened and what didn't happen. But the other piece of transparency is keeping the community informed. Um, keeping the community informed of what is happening. And that is kind of where, where Ephraim goes in. And Ephraim, if you don't mind, maybe talk about how we keep the community um, informed of instances that are, you know, whether they're happening on, in mainstream media or whether or not it's somebody that, um, uh, you know, didn't get a whole lot of notoriety, but how do we, uh, how are we transparent in what we do? Well, actually, we do that a few ways. Um, one, and I think it's probably one of the more important, and it really followed, honestly, the death of Laquan McDonald 
And it was 13 months before video was released in that particular incident. And, and we were all obviously um, impacted by what we witnessed. And it obviously it was tragic for, you know, family members of uh, obviously Laquan McDonald and it led to his death. So, you know, um, but that 13 month period really put a shift on the importance of releasing body worn camera, third party camera video. Um, anytime that there are 911 calls or transmissions, um, COPA now it has to is required uh, and is the holder of that information that releases it to the public on our website. We're required 60 days or less to release body worn third party video, um, 911 calls and, and other materials, police reports and things of that nature on our website in certain incidents because that transparency is just that important. Gone are the days of just taking the police department's word for it. Uh, gone are the days of just waiting uh, an extended period of time until, until an investigation is over, right? The community and the public uh, really require that transparency up front. And so COPA is a part of that process by all of the video and materials that we put out. We've put out over 300, uh, over in 300 incidents, um, we've put out video and other materials. And that's, that's a significant part. And that's, that's a significant progression from the past. And that's one that this community has desperately cried for. And so not only do we just put it on the website and expect people to find it, but we put a media release out to inform all of the media around the city of Chicago and national media that we have just put something out. But then we put it on our social media page as well, saying that we have just released video so that the public who follow us can know exactly when we are putting out information. And then finally, or maybe not finally, but in addition, is that as we release reports, we do the exact same thing. So there was a shooting uh, not too long ago with the red line when we were putting out uh, updates and when we released video and as we were progressing in our investigation, we, we put that out on social media. We put that out to them on our website and to the media so that they can inform the larger public. But then we're making those personal calls to community stakeholders, to aldermen, to community activists, and not just leaving it as a static kind of web link on our page, but we're being kind of active in, in, engagers in this because we understand if we're not inviting people into the conversation and we are just expecting people to find us without any effort, then that's where we lose. So we're very intentional about the transparency and then the communication factor after that, even down to when we close an investigation, we're bringing a family member in. They watch the video before it's released. We bring them in and we keep them updated all throughout. They can tell whoever they want uh, about the uh, status of the case as we progress, but then we bring that family back in and we sit them down and tell them step by step how we get to our conclusions. So all of that is important, whether it's the broad, broader Chicago community or those impacted members, all of that is important to transparency. And that's something that was not in place before. And uh, Chief Roberts has been very intentional about us driving that because whether people agree with our outcomes, they'll trust the transparency as long as we help them understand the process. And that's right. really what we've been getting at. All right. No, very helpful information. Um, I want to dig just a little bit deeper, uh, maybe look at the other side of the transparency. Chief Roberts, you mentioned um, transparency in the laws that govern our behavior. And those of us in the community needing to, to know what those laws are. And so same as you were saying, the uh, lack of familiarity on the police side, you know, the police officer side with some of the laws, absolutely, um, us as citizens and, you know, residents in a community, we're not always completely familiar. How are we bridging that gap of what we don't know to get to the community so that um, we're aware of what our rights are so that when we are stopped or when we are confronted by a police officer, where is that work happening? Yeah. Um, I will say I think a lot more needs to be done in, in, in that area. Um, I think that right now that might be one of the areas of police reform that might need to be beefed up. Um, I don't want to say the most, but a lot more work needs to happen in that regard. So COPA, um, obviously we do, we try to do our part. And one of the ways that we do that is the work that we do at CPS 
the work that we've done with the MICFA challenge, the work that we do with junior achievement and really explaining to them, you know, the, and, it, and it's really focused on use of force. You know, we, we've taken a subset of, of policing and um, take them through the use of force um, uh, procedures and protocols. Um, and I don't want to mess it up, but I, and, and maybe Ephraim can talk to you about it, but we do focus and provide a little bit of that on the uh, CPS level where I think the opportunity arises. And this is something that I think would enhance trust and confidence and build relationships with CPD is if CPD had the ability to do this more at the schools, at the boys and girls clubs, you know, that CPD is sitting and talking with, with you guys, um, that they're having these conversations um, because I think more of that is needed because again, all of this, you know, we're doing all of this to build trust and legitimacy in policing and knowing the laws, um, knowing what police can police, knowing how police are supposed to police. Um, as, as Ephraim mentioned, I might not have appreciated that you stopped me, but I at least know that this was a legitimate reason to stop me. And if I go home and have issues about it, I at least know who, who to call. So it is, it is an area um, for improvement um, in the city for sure. Um, and frankly, nationally, I think it's, a, it's, it's an area for improvement nationally. You from anything you wanna add? Thank you, Chief Roberts. Well, I, actually, I think Chief Roberts covered it. I mean, obviously, for, we've done it so well, honestly, with young people. And it's partially because it's connected to the school. And so the time, the really built in time is there. And, and young people, uh, and it is very intentional why we do it with high schoolers, because they are more active on social media. Mm -hmm. They're seeing a lot of things on social media and representations of interactions that may not be suitable or something that we would encourage, especially if people are not informed. So we spend a lot of time there and it's just our commitment, especially as a South Sider, it, it's a give back to the community, but also because, um, um, uh, and we do it just kind of around the city uh, uh, by really taking people not only through just the use of force, but also helping them understand some of the legal terms like totality of circumstances and object of reasonableness and things of that nature that they may not kind of like, why did an officer show up so aggressive? Well, it wasn't maybe just his actions, but it was what he was told that was based on a 911 call that came through on dispatch that brought his level, at least for his arrival. Now, once the officer arrives, they should assess and then they should maybe start to, you know, obviously take their actions down. But sometimes not even having that discussion people are only looking at an officer's initial response. So really taking the time to have that conversation. And I will say, uh, in addition, that is the beauty of what we do at COPA because the community for us is not just the civilians, but we're at every academy for every recruit. We're speaking to those, those, those potential officers and we're speaking to the captains, the lieutenants. Chief Roberts has done roll calls. And not only are we helping them understand our role, but we're also bringing that community piece in there to help them understand that we are trying to also inform the community. So that bridge that you talked about is really talking to both parties mm -hmm. as this independent group and really trying to at least bring some understanding to both, even if we can't bring them both to the same room. Awesome. So listening to what you're saying, um, it, it brings me to probably the question we'll use here to kind of wrap things up, but it really is one about um, learning. And as I hear you speaking of how you are sitting on kind of both sides of this, engaging with community uh, citizens and the officers themselves and then bringing them together in different ways. It's really at the, the, um, the core of debate that students are arguing both sides, right? And so as I heard you saying that, I immediately thought like, this is great because this is what we're wanting our students to do as they think about criminal justice reform. It isn't all just about this side of it, of the citizens, the you know, the residents, there is a side of those officers that, you know, living this day to day and, you know, um, putting them, themselves at harm to, to go out and protect and all of those pieces. And so when you think about all that 
there is for students to learn about reform work and um, policing. What are the things that you want us to make sure our students are thinking about as they're preparing their arguments for reform, right? From this side of the coin to that side of the coin. What, what do you both recommend that or would want our students to be looking at and thinking of and learning? So, um, you know, I, I will say this. I, I became a uh, law enforcement officer in 1989. <laughs> in 1989. Um, and um, my interest in law enforcement was because my father was a police officer. He had spent, um, after he retired, he was a captain 30, 30 plus years. Um, and we're from New Jersey, not from Chicago, but I've been here 20 years. So I hold Chicago. Okay. Um, but, and, and, and my brother is a police officer and we're good people. We're good people. We respect people. We treat people with kindness. Um, I have been able to do my job in a way where um, people have thanked me for being kind. Um, I've been able to do my job in a way where um, uh, I think is a procedurally and constitutionally just manner. Um, and I believe that my brother has done the same, my father has done the same, and there are many, 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 many law enforcement officers throughout this country that take pride in treating all people with respect and with dignity. And there are um, bad apples, but there are also good officers and good people that have made a grave mistake. They have made a grave mistake that means that they should lose their job. They have not committed a crime because they were allowed to use force, but they used too much force for the circumstances. And therefore, as Ephra mentioned, it wasn't proportional and it wasn't reasonable. And the, and the consequence of that is huge. Not only do they lose their job, but they have to live with that for the rest of their lives. But at the same token, we have to hold officers, every single one of them, and me included when I was a law enforcement officer, that despite being a good person and doing a good job, if I don't do that job, mm -hmm. I need to suffer the consequences mm -hmm. for doing that job. And so the takeaway is for me, for young people to one, uh, educate yourself beyond social media and the headlines, get the facts, and then ask for and judge the behavior on what happened and what you know to have happened, and then ask for what it is that we actually want. And what I think what we want is a constitutional policing that's carried out in a procedurally just manner. So let's educate ourselves on what policing is, educate ourselves on how policing should be carried out, and then ask for those things from your law enforcement agency that's going to, to produce that but not um, if we focus, if we focus our efforts on the belief that all police officers are bad, we're not going to get the results that, that we need. You know, we're not going to necessarily get better policing. Um, and so it's, it's, it's educating ourselves, educating ourselves so that we know what the issues are and that we bring our common sense to what those solutions are and then ask for that, ask for that, demand for that from the police department, from the police department, demand that from the elected officials. Got it. So that was my big spiel. 
No, that's great. And you're speaking to, you know, the language of, of um, policy debate is very much evidence and, um, you know, facts, data, using that information. It's, it's um, to, to make your argument, to enact change. You've, you've got to have some evidence. You've got to have some facts. And so I certainly appreciate hearing that. It won't be news to our students, but that is still so very important um, in all of this work. So thank you for that. Um, Ephraim, what, what would you add here in terms of, um, you know, our students and, and what they can learn from this topic? We are hearing um, in our community, unfortunately, all kinds of um, revolts against the police. And, um, oh my gosh, I can't think of this. Um, you know, they're, they're wanting to defund the police. And defund. this, yes, defund the police. I'm not sure exactly what that means, but defund the police. Um, I just heard a, a recent terminology, the um, all cops are bastards or something like that. I can't remember the acronym, but you're hearing these things kind of, you know, spewed in the community and, and people are riled up around it. Um, but to Chief Robert's point, we, we do need to educate. We do need to be aware and, and being very careful of labeling a whole group of people in one way based on some folks that have either acted inappropriately, made a mistake, whatever it might be. Um, but how are you, you know, then I know you're um, kind of over this, you know, marketing and communications and things of that nature for, for COPA. Um, thinking about all of those things, how do we help students, you know, to, to do the right thing? What do we want them to learn? What are your thoughts on that? Well, um, I would say, first of all, I appreciate you struggling with the ACAB uh, acronym because I wouldn't know yeah. it if my children Only didn't reason. tell me. So uh, we, get to date, we get to date ourselves together. Uh, <laughs> but I will say, you know, one, I think, you know, as a kid growing up in the city of Chicago, I had never spent any time with a police officer before working at COPA. And to Chief Roberts' point, um, I think there's a level of sensitivity that we all must try to have with just people at the basic human level and understanding that there are really good people who are out here trying to go to work and go to school uh, that are residents of the city of Chicago and officers to a certain degree are really trying to do the same thing. However, the weight of their responsibility or their actions can obviously be much more costly, but, but understanding just first at a basic level and having spent significant time at the police academy and with officers, there is a certain level of sensitivity that we all need to have in making sure that we're not prejudging an entire institution um, because of what we've seen and happen in particular areas. The other thing I would say is, to Chief Roberts' point, educate ourselves because some things, and Chief Roberts knows that we use this term often, are awful but lawful. And that is hard to sometimes take because again, you know it may be a person's life that may have been lost. Mm -hmm. And but also although things are awful but lawful in certain instances, young people are probably the reason why we are having this conversation today. Because after the death of Laquan McDonald, the way young people went to the streets, the, the way young people demanded change and got involved in policy and helped change laws or what have you. It is, it is so powerful that young people stay involved because you can shape the future of policing. You and, and that change doesn't have to wait till five years from now. I'm talking about next year, especially around election time, you know, become involved, put pressure where you believe pressure needs to be put and, and, and ask for the things that you believe are constitutional policing and the changes that you really need to see. I think that is, that has already been proven to work and young people were really behind the initiation of that, especially after the death of La Laquan McDonald. And it's okay to acknowledge that there have been decades of, of distrust. COPA knows that. As we go into the community, as we interact with people, we know that they don't just they don't trust us. And we're only three years in. We didn't even do it. We we were not even a part of the system at that time. But we don't we don't act like that distrust doesn't uh, isn't present. We 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 take that and we still desire to move things forward. And so um, I think that there is a way to do both. And uh, and I believe change comes because we demand it. And, and I think for young people, stay at it. 
And, and, and just because you're turned away at one place doesn't mean that it won't happen over time. And something that I often do with my children, they can't have anything without a form of negotiation. And they are often quick to get up from the table and walk away with nothing. I tell them, take what you can. Six months, come back and get more. And young people, I think, should be that same way. Don't walk away from the table of, of change with nothing. There's always something that you can take and then come back and get more within six months. So that's what I would say. I love it. I love it. Thank you. So our our students, you all heard it right here from Chief Robert, mm -hmm. from uh, Ephraim Edie. You all can make change. You can have an impact. You do need to educate yourselves. You do need to get the facts, get the evidence and use that in your arguments to be able to demand change. Um, and we know that it can happen, as you just heard um, Ephraim explaining the result from the uh, the unfortunate situation with Laquan McDonald, McDonald and how students really did drive a lot of that young people. And so thank you for that. And we are just about out of time. And I am, again, so thankful that you all have joined us today. We're going to have to have you come back because this is such a heavy topic with so many different layers that we could just go on and on about this. I will put it back in your court here to just, you know, chief to say, is there any last thing that you want to say um, to the students, to our coaches, anything? Yeah, I, I would really just like to say that I am so proud of the, the work that Chicago Debates um, does. I do believe in debate. I think it makes us it makes us able to have tough conversations. It, it, it teaches us how to listen and it teaches us how to focus on, on achieving the outcome or at least expressing the outcome that we're looking for. Um, and to me, when we can speak about the issue, when we can listen, to what is what other people are saying, we are better positioned to make change. And Chicago Debates does that. Um, my nieces and nephews were all debaters. Um, one um, uh, debated all through through college. Um, so uh, I support it. I'm happy for you guys, and I'm so glad that I got the opportunity to speak with you. Thank you so much, Ephraim. Any last words? Um, I would echo Chief Roberts. Uh, first of all, just the opportunity, just knowing that there is a group that is t coming together to uh, facilitate these kind of discussions and young people's interests. I would say just based on your interests and, and, and whatever profession you go into, especially if it's in the legal, there are so many opportunities, whether it is obviously in the courtroom, uh, defending or prosecuting or an agency like COPA, there are so many avenues to affect change. And whichever side you pick, you know, uh, I tell people you can either go for the cameras or you can go for credibility. And so credibility doesn't always put you in front of a camera, but eventually it does work out in terms of your, not only your personal favor, but the larger favor of what you're after. So uh, whichever role or, 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 or path that you take uh, as it relates to criminal justice, uh, you're really going to be a benefit to, to humanity as a whole, especially here in the city of Chicago. And I'm, I'm glad to say, although my kids are not a part of Chicago debate, debates, my, my kids are actually, my two oldest are actually uh, on the debate team. So uh, that's probably why they, they argue me down often. So I can only imagine <laughs> what you guys experience here. <laughs> Love it. Love it. And we never get very far from uh, folks who have either debated or have connections to debate. And so um, glad to hear that, that that exists with the two of you as well. Thank you again for your time. I look forward to um, connecting and engaging with you in the near future. Um, and we really just appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. Thank you. See you later. Bye bye.